Good morning, church. What an honor it is to bring a message to you this morning. I want to say thank you to Pastor Aaron and Pastor Mike and the staff here at UPPC. When I became a Presbyterian here at UPPC some 25 years ago, I was intrigued to learn that you had a season of preparation leading up to Christmas, the season of Advent. You have to understand that Advent was not something we did in the Baptist church of my childhood. Back then, Christmas seemed to begin right after Thanksgiving, which gave us pretty much the entire month to work through the whole catalog of Christmas songs in the hymnal. I think the closest I ever got to Advent was one of those little calendars with the chocolate hiding behind the doors. So, as a relative newcomer to Presbyterianism, I have to say, Advent is kind of strange. Consider, while the rest of the culture is gearing up for our annual festival of mass consumerism, Advent says, watch and wait. The day of redemption is coming, but it's not here yet. And while the rest of the culture starts singing happy, nostalgic songs about jingle bells and chestnuts roasting and snowmen with magic hats, Advent says, no, no, here are some older haunting songs. Songs about watchmen looking for the morning or roses blooming in midwinter. And at a time when most of us are stretched thin and tempted to be anxious or distracted, Advent calls us to pay attention, to stay awake in anticipation of what God is about to do in our midst through Jesus Christ. I've learned to think of Advent as a kind of recommendation from Christians past. The recommendation says, do this, discipline yourselves by watching and waiting that you may be ready to experience the joy of Christmas. Of course, one of the most fundamental ways we do this is through prayer. And so this morning, we'll be digging into one of the classic Old Testament passages on prayer. I'll be reading from the book of Isaiah, beginning in the middle of of chapter 63. Here the prophet on behalf of his people is pouring out his heart before God. Listen now for the word of God. Why, Lord, do you make us wander from your ways and harden our hearts so we do not revere you? Return for the sake of your servants the tribes that are your inheritance. For a little while your people possessed your holy place, but now our enemies have trampled down your sanctuary. We are like those you have never ruled, like those never called. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you, as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil, come down to make your name known to your enemies. Cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continued to sin against them, you were angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you, 
For you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. O oh, look on us, we pray, for we are all your people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Not enough has been made of the fact that the Bible is full of prayers like this one, where the person praying is obviously devastated by how life has turned out. Of course, there are also upbeat prayers, prayers of thanksgiving and celebration, prayers especially fitting for the week just past. But it's a striking thing about the Bible that there are these other kinds of prayers. Prayers of raw honesty. Prayers of spiritual desolation and struggle. Prayers for times when the world seems to be falling apart. It's pretty clear that whatever Isaiah was hoping for, whatever he was counting on, whatever he was working towards, all of that is gone crushed under the wheels of current events. And yet, his response is to pray. Disappointment, loss, hardship, none of these ultimately has the ability to weaken his faith. Instead, it drives him to pay attention to God as never before. We might think of Isaiah as the patron saint of Advent, what do I mean? Well, when we look closely at this text, we discover that there are actually three strands, three distinct strands to this prayer. Every one of them expresses something that I believe all of us need to say to God. And by placing this prayer in the word of God, God has taken the extraordinary step of giving us the words that we need in order to reach out to him. Let me say that again. By placing this prayer in his word, God has taken the extraordinary step of teaching us to pray, giving us his own words, using the example, the model of Isaiah. So what are these three strands of Isaiah's prayer? The first strand is lament. Why, Lord? This is the essential question. Isaiah wants to know why God hasn't stepped in and done something. Where are the unmistakable signs? Where are the miraculous interventions? Isaiah obviously remembers what the Lord did on behalf of Abraham and Sarah. He's read the story of how the Lord called Moses and brought Israel up out of Egypt in the Exodus. But all of that now is ancient history. If God is good, and he is, and if God acts on behalf of those who wait for him, which he does, then why? This is Isaiah's question. This strand of prayer, lament, lifts all of our darkest, most intense feelings into the light. Lament dares to believe that our sense of loss or discouragement or anger or doubt or confusion, everything, in fact, that we're feeling and facing, all of this is somehow still within bounds for prayer. Lament gathers up the broken pieces of our lives, it makes an offering out of our suffering. When I think back on the year that's coming to a close, I'm struck by how many things have happened that call out for just this kind of prayer. 
It's been a year of firestorms and windstorms, hurricanes and floods, a year of protests against police brutality and systematic racial injustice. It's been a year of record unemployment and epic levels of government dysfunction. Meanwhile, the pandemic is still upending our way of life. Small businesses are closing. Hospitals now are struggling. Communities are hurting. It feels as if we are isolated from each other, not only politically and geographically, but emotionally as well. Many people I know are trying hard to connect with each other, either through phone calls or emails, FaceTime or video meetings, but somehow the inability to be present to each other is still missing. It's not the same through technology as in person. If we look at 2020 through the lens of Isaiah, we can see the value of lament. Every one of us needs to connect our struggle to the promise of God's grace. Isaiah shows us how. His prayer is not neat and tidy. Lament never is. But it is honest. Absolutely, painstakingly honest. Maybe this Advent is a time for us to relearn the language of lament. Trusting God enough to place everything before him in prayer. The second strand in Isaiah's prayer is repentance. Confessing our sin before God. The part that stands out to me is in verse 6. Isaiah says, We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. You'll recall that in the biblical imagination, a faithful person is grounded and secure. Psalm 1, for example, employs the image of the faithful person as a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither. What does Isaiah do but turn this familiar image upside down? When we sin, we cut ourselves off from our roots. We lose out on the nourishment that we need in order to thrive spiritually. And so he says, like the wind, our sins sweep us away. Now, nobody ever wants to repent. Of all the spiritual disciplines in the Bible, and there are dozens, confession is probably the one we want most to avoid. Instead, we humans have a track record of hiding from the truth. Or we pretend that everything is all right. In fact, it's not uncommon these days to hear someone give a fake apology. Going through the motions of saying, I'm sorry, without actually admitting to have done anything wrong. Isaiah wants none of this fakery and pretension. His prayer is relentlessly truthful. He takes a long look at his own life and at the spiritual lives of his fellow Israelites, and what he sees is alarming. We are like those you have never ruled, he says, like those never called. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you. What a devastating indictment of his own people. Isaiah realizes that Israel has broken faith with God. They have stopped praying. They have quit seeking to follow after God. They have been living like the surrounding nations, like people who do not know the goodness of walking with God. And since this is the case, nothing good can come until they turn around and begin to tell the truth about their sin. By what they have done and what they have left undone, they have not lived up to their calling that God has placed on their lives. Yet what was true in Isaiah's day is still true for us today. 
Isaiah's final strand is a declaration of faith. This is prayer that boldly restates the deepest truth about our relationship with God. He says, you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. To name ourselves as clay recalls the book of Genesis and of the first human being that God formed out of the dust. Just like Adam, Isaiah is saying, we have the imprint of God's hands upon us. We have God's own breath in our lungs. This image of God as the potter is so powerful, it brings two memories to my mind. A while back, I was washing dishes when a little clay cup slipped out of my hands and fell, cracked in the bottom of the sink. Never a good sign. This was a cup that my daughter had made in pottery class. It's the only one of its kind, shaped by her hands, and you can imagine my feeling of dread when that happened. Fortunately, only the base was cracked. The, the main part of the cup was still okay. What a relief that I didn't break the whole thing. But that near miss with the cup reminded me of another experience from my childhood. Now, parents know that kids are going to break stuff. It happens. It's going to happen. You can't stop it from happening. It's part of life, and it's usually no big deal. But on this occasion, I must have been seven or eight years old, I dropped a water glass in the kitchen by accident, and it shattered all over the floor. And for some reason, my mother burst into tears. She didn't yell at me. She didn't criticize me for being clumsy. But she cried. In fact, she cried like someone who's lost something that can't be replaced. And after she'd gotten out the broom and the dustpan and helped me clean up the mess, she told me why. She said, that water glass was a gift from my wedding. She explained that it had originally been part of a set, but over the years, one by one, each of those glasses had been dropped and broken. And the one that I broke was the very last one. At which point I too started crying, even though she gave me a hug and told me that she forgave me. Now my sense is that some of us are entering this holiday season with something like a sense of relief. Our cup is cracked, but not yet broken. Others of us are looking down at the kitchen floor of our lives covered with broken glass and asking, what just happened? And some of us are feeling the sharp sting of loss. Someone or something that we loved is now gone from the world and there's no way to fill that void. Isaiah's declaration of faith applies to all of us. Only God, the master potter who made us, who loves us, can bring about the healing and restoration that we so desperately desire. So, lamenting, confessing, declaring our faith. These are the central strands of Advent prayer. Prayer that gives vent to our deepest feelings, that wrestles with hard questions, and finally dares to be absolutely honest with God. It's never easy to watch and wait, the Advent recommendation. But Isaiah teaches us that such prayer is anything but passive. He's restless with God because he knows that unless God himself comes down into our midst, into the mess of our broken world and the mire of our sin, we have no hope of deliverance. And so he prays, Oh, that you would rend the heavens 
and come down? Do you hear the ragged persistence in Isaiah's prayer? There's a determination here not to let go of God. Let's learn this year to pray like Isaiah. Lamenting what is lost and broken. Confessing what is wrong. And finally, throwing ourselves upon the mercy of God who comes to meet us in Jesus Christ. This is our hope and our calling. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.